Today we are going to do the Four Directions Prayer today as shared with us by our indigenous neighbors. And we're going to start by facing east, which is the back of the church. So please turn around. Facing east, from the direction where light breaks forth, we praise you, God, of all life. From a place of new beginnings, Jesus calls us to become like a child, giving us the capacity to believe in possibilities, both seen and unseen. May the sparks of faith embolden us. Please face south, which turn to your right 90 degrees. <laughs> We celebrate warm breezes and youthful vitality. We are aware of how this season in which we must prepare for the future. We pray that summer's generosity will sustain all peoples of the world in the coming winter. Please face west, which is the front. Facing west, where the absence of light sometimes creates in us an uncertainty that tests us. Abiding one. We remember that you will accompany us as we seek to shut out the clamor, embrace the stillness, and pray, as Jesus prayed, for perseverance and direction. Please face north. Facing north, a place of white snow that reminds us of the wise ones who possess the ability to remember, synthesize, understand, and interpret. The arrival of winter brings invitation for the earth to rest. Today, as we embrace Sabbath, may each one of us be strengthened and empowered to fulfill our purpose for this time and place. And please return to the front. Returning forward to face one another. With eyes wide open to see the circle before us has no beginning and no ending. And so we praise you Great and holy God, for your unending promise of new life. Amen. Please be seated and join in our prayer and confession. O great Creator, look at what has happened. Lands have been stolen, drinking water must be bought. We are exhausted. Many must beg for food. Wars are waged against the innocent. Bodies are taken advantage of. Elders are disrespected. Many work for low pay in unsafe conditions. The sounds of violence and loss drown out the melodies of music and laughter of play. We feel like you have forgotten us. We fear that you have rejected us in the anger for parts we have played in the desecration of your creation. O oh, Creator God, earth cries out for you. Our hearts ache and our spirits are weary from the experiencing the rending of the web of all of our relations. Forgiving God, help us hear your voice and your will through the sounds of the struggles of this world. Amen. The Creator sent us, Jesus Christ, to teach us how to walk the good road. His life and his death show us that we must always work towards justice, towards peace, and towards love for all creation, no matter the cost. Ultimately, in God, we have been forgiven. Let God's peace fill your hearts, because when we follow Jesus, every day is a chance to start over yet again. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to share the peace of Christ in any way you wish. There we go. Hi! Love the rhythm. So, this is one of those songs that has an action to it. And when we sing, draw the circle wide, we take our hands and we make a big circle. They have a hard time doing that. Can you show them how to do that? Can you make a big circle? Okay, can we stand up and do it? Big circle. So every time we sing, draw the circle wide, big circle, and try not to hit your sister. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Ready, Eddie? <laughs> Yeah. 
Please be seated. And it's unfortunate not more of you can be up here because I have a lovely singer beside me. Abby was singing along to most of that. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to try something different today. I forgot my prayer. One of the most beautiful indigenous traditions is storytelling. So I'm going to try that today. And this story comes from our Muslim brothers, brothers and sisters. And Muslims love God, but they show that love in different ways. And they share this story with us because it says the same message that we believe. There was a man named David. And David had a beautiful garden. He had vegetables and fruits and flowers and bushes. And David spent every minute he could in that garden. And he planted, and he weeded, and he watered, and he plucked, and he pruned, and sometimes he just went out to sit in his garden and admire the creation around him. David really loved his garden. Unfortunately, David's sister got very, very sick. And so David had to go away for a long time to care for his sister while she got better. And he knew he was going to be gone away too long, and his garden would wither and maybe even die while he was gone. So he asked a friend, John, John, would you come take care of my garden? And John agreed. So David went away to take care of his sister, and John came to take care of the garden. And he was there every day. And he planted, and he watered, and he weeded, and he plucked, and he picked, and he spent time just sitting in the garden, admiring the beauty of creation. And John came to love that garden. And a long, long time later, David came home because his sister was better. And he came home and he thanked John for doing such a wonderful job of caring for the beautiful garden. But John said, you've been gone a very long time. And I put my heart and soul into this garden. And I love this garden. So this garden now belongs to me. <clears throat> And David said, no, this is my garden. This garden belongs to me. And the two men argued back and forth, and they couldn't find resolution. So they went to find the most well, wisest person they could find. They found a woman named Jenny. And they asked Jenny to come, and she did. And Jenny sat with them and listened, and David told his story, and John told his story. And when they were done speaking, Jenny didn't say a word. She kneeled down on the earth, Put her ear to the ground and just listen. And she listened. And when she was done, she stood up and John and David were going, What was that about? And Jenny said, I've listened to Mother Earth. And Mother Earth has said, You're both wrong. This garden is a gift from God. And God has told you to take care of this land. You belong to the garden. Not the garden belongs to you. And both David and John, you are responsible to care for this garden and make it nurture. Jenny was a very wise person. And actually, she echoes exactly what's said in the very first book of our Bible, in Genesis. Where God, you have a Bible? That's really good. We should all have Bibles. And in Genesis, it says, we are to take care of creation. We don't own creation. We are to take care of it. And so we belong to the earth, not the other way around. All right. Any questions? That's my attempt at storytelling. <laughs> okay. Let us say a prayer. Oh, great. I lost it again. Thank you. Repeat after me. <clears throat> Generous God. Thank you. Thank you. For your gifts of trees. For your gifts of trees. Rivers, and rivers and soil. Every kind of animal. Every kind of animal. And every kind of plant. And every kind of plant. Thank you for this beautiful world. Thank you for this beautiful world. Help us to care for your world. Help us to care for your world. And all that lives in it. As our gift of love for you. As our gift of love for you. Amen. Amen. So we have two.
two excellent prayer readers. Hmm, I'm thinking I might get the two of you to lead our prayer next week because you two do a great job. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go have some fun. Or stay here. Today's reading is from the first book of John, chapter 3 and 11, verse 16, uh, 2 to 24. But this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commands and we do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's command lives in them. Sorry. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know what he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gives us. The second piece is from Luke, uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, good guys. Thank you. So today, I won't be sharing a reflection. We're going to be listening to Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole again. And I have a short intro, and excuse me, I'm going to read it, because if I don't, I've lied to the law for far too long. During our last regional meeting in May, Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole gave a 30-minute presentation on the history of Indigenous relations in the United Church of Canada, and the current remit about the future of the Indigenous Church. So remits are questions that are asked and voted on by United Church Communities of Faith and Councils when we're facing a significant decision. In June, we watched about 10 minutes of this presentation, where she gave a summary of the United Church history with Indigenous peoples. And this morning, I pulled together another 10 minutes from her presentation that help us to understand the remit that we have to vote on this year. Before we watch your video, I'd like to give a little bit of background just to give some context. <coughs> the remit that we're considering is part of our process for establishing an autonomous national indigenous organization within the United Church of Canada. We've been working towards this for almost 60 years. It's been a very slow process. Currently, there are about 65 indigenous communities of faith in the United States Church of Canada. And these churches used to belong to what was called the All Native Circle Conference. 
However, when the United Church of Canada eliminated conference and presbyteries, and we went to a regional model in 2020, the all-native circle conference was also dissolved. And those indigenous churches instead became members of their local region. The intent, what we are trying to do now, is to form a national indigenous organization within the United Church of Canada which will be governed by indigenous people according to their tradition. However, to do that, we need exemptions from some of our current regulations and policies. And from those of you who have been in the United Church very long, we have a lot of regulations and policies. So we have two ways to do this. We can either ask the Indigenous Churches to develop new policies and procedures, and then submit them for consideration and approval by all the other United Churches. This would be an iterative process. In effect, they would need to ask our permission for every change they need to realize Indigenous leadership and management. I won't go into that. Sorry. The idea of the Indigenous churches asking for permission of us to lead in the way based on their traditions just brings wrong. So for General Council proposed another time. They've asked for us to vote to allow the Indigenous churches to determine and establish their own governance structures and processes without having to ask for any additional per permissions from the other United Churches. So the remit that we have before us now is that proposal to create the Autonomous National Indigenous Organization within the United Church of Canada with its own mechanisms to make its own cha changes as it sees necessary. Let's turn it over to Reverend Teresa. Anin, Sego, hello. My name is Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole. My spirit name is Skunandam, which is best uh, translated as clear mind. I think that's rather debatable on some days. <laughs> My people are Mohawk from the Tyendega Denega territory, and I am a member of the Wolf Clan. I serve you as the Indigenous representative on the executive of Eeyore, and I also serve as the Indigenous rep for my sins on the General Council uh, executive. In keeping with the oral tradition of Indigenous people, I'll share with, with you what I have learned and ask you to listen to my words with both your minds and your hearts. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the court concerning the remit which is before us. Now, if you're not sure of what a remit is, it's a church procedure that's required when an amendment is made to the basis of union. Now, this makes sense if you understand the basis of union to be our agreement concerning how we will live with one another. This remit is required because the indigenous church has asked for the obstacles currently in the way of their continued restructuring to be cleared away. We in the indigenous church believe that Creator is calling us to continue constructing the governance framework of the national indigenous circle. This work requires changes to the church's structure so that it properly reflects both the governance of the Indigenous United Church and its relationship to General Council and General Council Executive. Our General Secretary, Michael Blair, has responded to this call by putting forward this unique remit. Now, I say it's unique because it's preemptive in nature. That is, he's advocating that we, as the United Church, clear the path to allow change without knowing the final shape of what the Indigenous Church will be. Because guess what? It's still growing. As the basis of union stands now, the Indigenous Church would have to come hat in hand to the settler church for permission to continue the restructuring of the indigenous church. 
The days of that kind of paternalistic colonial approach are over. Let me repeat that. The days of that kind of paternalistic approach are over. And the indigenous church is asking to be equal and respected partners with the settler United Church. Instead of missions to the Indians, which is the language that has been used in the past, we're inviting the settler church to a four-way partnership between God, the United Church of Canada, the indigenous church, and the rest of creation. What the General Secretary is inviting us to do is take a courageous step and set aside our colonial need for structure and control and let the indigenous church develop itself in the ways that they think God is calling them. Now, I am the first to say remits are incredibly complex. They require a majority of regions and individual uh, church councils to vote in agreement. And friends, I have to tell you, we've already got one hand tied behind our back. Apathy, or the lack of response uh, of a pastoral charge, is counted as a no vote. So if you don't do anything, you're voting against the remit. We must simply not let that happen. Now, this seems straightforward except for one little detail. And that is, most of the indigenous church doesn't know you, and you, my friends, don't know us. Most United Church folks don't know the rich and deep history of the indigenous United Church. And without such knowledge, this remit must seem to come right out of the blue. So what follows, I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of the indigenous United And then restructuring Church. came. And if restructuring in 2019 was hard on us, it was devastating in, uh, in the indigenous church because the All Native Circle Conference was dissolved right along with the rest of the conferences. That was very painful because the indigenous church had found ways to work together, uh, ways that uh, were consensus and circular. And all of a sudden they were tossed into this other thing. In fact, they weren't even tossed into one thing. They were tossed into a whole bunch of regions, um, knowing that we needed to do something different um, with the indigenous church, but we just weren't sure what that was going to be. Well, we ended up uh, with the National Indigenous Council and a National Elders Council. And the United Church directed its indigenous communities of faith to figure out how to be the indigenous United Church. And folks, that's what we're working on. And that's what this remit is about. And while it was difficult to lose ANCC, there was hope and there was a little bit of excitement about what could possibly happen with this new entity. And then 2015, 215 graves are found at the former Kamloops Residential School. The bandage is ripped off and trust erodes again between the indigenous communities and the United Church. It's been two steps forward, one step back. So my question to you is, is the remit going to be a step forward? I have to tell you, the stakes are very high. And what hangs in the balance is the future of approximately 66 indigenous communities of faith. My prayer is that the passing of the remit will let the indigenous church know that they are part of us and that we do want a healthy, decolonized relationship. One image that was used in the, um, the NIC proposal that kicked this off was that of the two-row wampum belt. That's what happens when you put a mohawk on the steering committee to make <laughs> it work. The two-row wampum belt uh, is a symbol of two canoes 
side by side, sharing resources and vision, but each paddling their own canoe. And if you have ever paddled a canoe, you know that trying to paddle somebody else's canoe at the same time lands you in the water, yeah. right? So I'll end this presentation by leaving you with a question. What will the message of the United Church be? What will they say to indigenous people if this remit is allowed to fail? Um, there is actually a question up here at the front. Phyllis McRae from Emmanuel United Church in Ottawa. I have a question. It's a question about I think, uh, the governance. I think I understand from reading the material that the purpose is to remove the um, barriers of having to take all the changes that will come out of the National Indigenous Organization to the church through a remit process. I think I, that makes sense to me. So what is, the, what is then the relationship, we do that, what is the relationship between the National Indigenous Organization and their decision making and the General Council Executive? Is there a process of ratification or oversight um, once the NIO makes its decisions, what happens then? It's my understanding um, that we're still discussing how that will fit together. It looks like um, there's been a request that uh, there be um, uh, some representation on the General Council Executive from the Indigenous Church, and they've also asked that there be a, re um, a representative from the General Council Executive uh, be on their committee so that the the lines of communication will happen and flow easily. Um, the plan is to uh, present um, a more detailed um, plan to the National Indigenous Spiritual Gathering, which will be happening in late July. That is the decision-making body for the Indigenous Church. And then, um, then more information will go from there back to the General Council Executive and to General Secretary. So, we're not voting on this remit today, but your council and I are asking for your direction on how you want to proceed. We have two options. Before we have a vote, I need to provide you with more information, background documentation, and give you answer any questions that might come up. And then we can either call a congregational meeting at some time in the future, I'm hoping not later than November, when everyone in the uh, community debate, everyone in their congregation will vote on whether we approve this remit or not. The other option is you ask your council to vote on your behalf, and I will teach them and give them materials, answer their questions or any questions you pass to them, and then we will let council vote on whether we approve this or not. So the question I have today, in preparation for the next step in this process is, do you want to vote as a congregation on this remit, or do you want council to vote on your behalf? Before I get your input, are there any questions? All right. Okay. Oh, yes, no. Can we combine as congregational meetings to present the information, and then decide whether we vote as a congregation or whether we have it over? If we're going to do that, we will vote at the congregation, simply because I'd be repeating the process twice. And I think it's a good idea for anyone in the congregation who wants to know more to get that information. So I will be offering those information sessions and reading material. But if I give that to the congregation as a whole, as a congregational meeting, then we might as well vote what we're doing. You understand what I mean? As opposed to making a two-step process. That's my belief. So, sorry for being on the slide. Sorry? I need to get the information and then have time to process. Okay. Understood. Understood. So, um, Don is correct. There is more background information, reading material that goes with this, and I can offer information sessions and answer your questions. If that is the case, then I suggest my recommendation is that we do a council meeting, or sorry, a, a congregational meeting where we can discuss it more hopefully and answer any questions. Any other questions in there or points? All right, this is an informal vote. How many here would prefer to have a congregational meeting where we discuss it and answer questions and then vote as a congregation? Okay. 
Okay? How many would, oh sorry, I didn't get your books back here. Okay? How many would prefer to have council vote on your behalf? Oh, okay. So, it looks like council uh, is the preference of most of the people here. That does not mean that you who want to have a congregational meeting are excluded. I will offer information sessions. I will send out additional information. And you are certainly welcome to participate by asking questions of your council. Are there any other points or things you want to raise? I'm sorry, Bill, to put you on the spot. Thank you. So our way ahead is that we will offer more education. Once we've answered the questions from everybody in the congregation, and you provide your input to your council representatives, we'll have the council vote. Thank you. We're going to try to proceed quickly with our service. And next is to offer thanks for all of your offerings and gifts, time and money. And please pray with me. Generous God, we have received so much from you in Christ and in creation. Bless the gifts we offer so that they will speak of your love in the world in all its detail and diversity. May our gifts touch the need around us in the name of Christ, who makes us one. Amen. We are now having a communion service, and I ask Nancy to come forward and share in the communion liturgy with you. While we're preparing, thank you. Sorry, bread of life. One of those days.
strength to honor God and to give our thanks. We give our thanks to God. Creator and giver of all life, source of love. We bless you for all your gifts. You brought creation to birth and sent prophets to awaken us to your great dream. A dream in which everyone is treated with dignity and love, justice and mercy, honor and hospitality. We praise you for elders and prophets, visionaries and leaders, teachers and preachers, all who have shared the great truth of your love. As we gather at this feasting table, we remember that on the night that he died, Jesus feasted with his friends. He took a loaf of bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, given for you. Whenever you feast together, Remember me. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, passed it to his friend, saying, Drink. This cup is the promise of God made in my blood. Whenever you drink together, remember me. Remembering your boundless love shown to us in Jesus Christ, we offer you our praise as we proclaim the great mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, your altars are now ready. Come to the table with all of our kin and share with all in need the gift of healing for those of us in pain. The gift of reconciliation for those of us estranged, the gift of assurance for those of us in doubt, and the gift of hope for those of us in tears. May we share these gifts, share Christ with one another in all of our need. Would the communion service please come forward? And as we have the last few times, we are using tongs to share the bread. The server will pick up the host and drop it in your hand. Please don't grab it from the palms. Who is serving the wine with the juice? Mary Mar has gluten-free bread, should anyone need that. We ask that our music ministry come forward first, and then everyone else to join in. us in this meal and fed our bodies and souls. 
we have heard your love. Now send us out to speak it. We have seen your love. Now send us out to show it. We have been fed by your love. Now send us out to share it. And let all things be done for your glory. Amen. Amen. Before I start the prayers of the people, are there situations or people with which, for which, you'd like us to pray? Aaron? Uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Please. <laughs> Let us pray. We remember the children of the Indian residential schools. We remember how they were plucked up from their homes by a system of arrogance that denied a good way of life. Their tears, their hunger, their loneliness, and their fears are not forgotten. The shame that was taught lingers yet. The pain that was inflicted upon their bodies remains. We remember the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the grandmas and grandpas left to grieve the empty places in their homes and their communities. Mothers were left with tear-stained aprons. Fathers suffered an unyielding silence. How it was they were expected to carry on, having lost their joy, their purpose. And how was it that their community continued to come together to celebrate life and move together toward a bright future? when their future was gone. How long will it take to strengthen family, homes, and spirits? How long will it take to heal the memories? Who must we be, and what must we do to restore integrity and dignity, dignity to your word? God of all great transformation, in our lament we cry out to you. God of all healing power, in our pain we call your name. God of all life and our hope, we come before you in humble prayer. We pray that every child may once again sing and dance the songs planted in their hearts since time immemorial. We pray that in their play and in their learning, they be strengthened in wisdom and truth. May they carry the knowledge of their ancestors, those ways of life that brought abundance and joy to this pilgrimage on earth. We pray for the children's health and fullness, that they may reconnect with your unending love, and that they may once again know who they are, their giftedness and their value. We remember those children who have found their home in you. We acknowledge those who left this earth having heard no words of apology or lament. We are grateful that you hold these ones close and have granted them eternal peace. As we move ahead into a time of truth telling and reconciliation. Loving, gracious, caring God, there are many people in our hearts today, those that are struggling, those who have poor health, those who are grieving, those who are searching for a way ahead despite all the challenges in their life. Lord, this morning we pray for heaven. We pray for Andrea. We pray for Elizabeth. We pray for Susan. We pray for Vivian. We pray for Don. We pray for Carolina. We pray for Fatima. And we pray for Gar. We pray for all of your children who this day need your strength and who have Forgotten how much that you love them really. We pray in your name. 
Gracious God, we offer you these prayers to you and continue to pray in the way that Jesus taught us. Our Mother and Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In our order of service, we had planned to sing another hymn now, but I apologize that we've gone a little long today, so I'm going to suggest that we skip the next hymn. Is that okay? These are some of God's promises. Let us go with the assurance of God's mercy, the passion of Christ's love, and the support of the Spirit's peace to continue honoring every child as we journey towards justice and healing. May it be so. And let us go out singing, Peace Go With You.